So we're halfway through 2022 and the four horsemen have been unleashed. War, pestilence, famine and uh, death are out and about. Okay, that's probably going too far. But the truth is, it's a difficult time in the world. We do have an actual war that is leading to famine in some places. It is certainly disrupting supply chains and monetary chains all over the world, particularly in Europe. China's struggling again under COVID, as are many other countries. And across the board, we have uncertainty in the marketplace. We have lots of interest rates and inflation concerns. During this time, it's look, what's happening to the watch industry is not front of mind for most people in the world. But you know what? You can't always worry about the big things. Sometimes, particularly inside a hobby, it's okay to sweat the small stuff and wonder how is all of that impacting on us. So that's what I'm going to do today. Have a quick look at what's the state of play for the watch industry, focusing mostly, to be honest, on the Swiss watch industry. I'm going to assume it flows over reasonably well to the Germans and the Japanese. What's going on with that industry and how are things looking? There's two distinctly different views on how the industry is going, depending on whether you play in the primary or the secondary market. If you're a watchmaker and you play in the primary market, things are looking pretty good. According to the latest figures from the Federation Orology, for the six months leading up to July, overall sales or revenue is up nearly 12%, and volume is up for the first time in a while, up 3.2%. Um, so all in all, that's doing pretty well. Remember, that's against a pretty good year in 2021. Some quirks in that number of uh, watches being sold – that increase is almost entirely in electronic watches, quartz watches. Actual sales of mechanical watches are down by 100,000 compared to last year. This kind of flows through when we look at the sale of Swiss watches by price. And you see the very entry end going really quite well, the quite expensive and very expensive end going quite well. But that area which would retail for five to 1200 Swiss francs or US dollars is continuing to struggle. Probably one of the reasons why we're desperately seeing brands try and get as far as they can away from that area. I also can't help but think that a lot of that growth at the low end is moon swatch driven. Those are probably exports of the moon swatch over the last month to two months. Looking at the annual figures, we can see that the year started with a real rush, at one point surging to well over 30% of where it was, 30% more than where it was this time last year. That probably on its own was always unsustainable, but it's clear to see that the industry has really tried to pull back the reins and are throttling that back really quite aggressively. I think this perfectly represents the kind of behaviour that we should expect from the Swiss watch industry post-COVID. During that time, we saw the Swiss watch industry take a lot of action. Around about 6% of their workforce got cut. A number of their smaller and less profitable suppliers were removed. Uh, a lot of big watch manufacturers, a lot of the big groups – took their distribution and direct sales under control a lot more tightly. And you could see that they were moderating their production against demand much faster than they had in the past. I'd always said that I thought that that discipline would be maintained post-COVID, and I think we are seeing exactly that. I don't believe that in 2017, 2018, we would have seen the industry pull the reins so hard on exports as we are seeing right now. Does that mean that we're never going to get to any more discounts? Absolutely not. In fact, I've heard rumours discounts are starting to open up again. I think we will head slowly towards a mild, a healthy oversupply of watches, getting into a place where 
10 to 15% discounts would be considered kind of normal. Shouldn't forget that it wasn't that long ago that 10 to 15% was not an uncommon discount to get on a Rolex. So I think if you could, if the industry sort of gets to the point where that's an expectation, um, I think that's actually not a bad place, and I suspect that they would be quite happy to get there as well. What the industry will be seeking to do and that why they're pulling the rein so hard is they never want to get to that point of having hundreds of thousands of watches being dumped into Joma Shop and then being sold at 50 and 60% off. I honestly believe those days are done. Getting into it a bit more detail, what you can see is across the board, the big groups are reporting really solid results. LVMH are reporting great numbers. Now, they combine their watches and jewellery, but if you look at that number that they've got and even extract the, the growth they effectively bought by buying Tiffany, that's end of the market got 16% growth. Likewise, if you go over to Swatch, depending on when you, how you slice and dice the uh, currency and the exchange rates, they've got somewhere between seven and a half and six and a half percent growth for this uh, half year so far, and they're well on track to get double digit growth um, for the rest of the year. What's really interesting is. Again, you see that element of increased discipline and cost control coming through. That 6% increase in 6.5% increase in sales is being matched with a 25% increase in operating profit. Finally, you've got Richemont. We haven't got uh, half yearly results for them, but I've got a quarterly result, and that shows 150 million Swiss franc odd uh, increase in revenues in this quarter as compared to the same quarter last year. So again, a really solid number from them. Speaking of Richemont, this is an interesting jumping off point. Uh, a week or so ago, there was reports in uh, WatchPro that there are unhappy shareholders in Richemont demanding that the group change their CEO and change their behavior, get back to their knitting, which is making and wholesaling luxury products, not running an e-commerce site. I'll tell you what is like what is going to happen. The family that runs Richemont will not give a rat's bum what their shareholders think and they will do whatever they want. I keep saying that you I keep hearing from you and I see in comments all the time people talking about how the big groups are beholden to their shareholders. The truth is if you look at their behavior they're not the Ruperts will run Richemont however the Ruperts want. The Arnauds will do whatever they want with LVMH and the Hayeks will do whatever they want with Swatch. Case in point, despite the fact that we've got some grumpy shareholders telling Richemont to get out of the e-sales group, they've doubled down and they're going big on a whole new campaign at a Mr. Porter. Okay, so getting away from primary, going across to the secondary sales, and things are not so rosy. We've all been watching. I've done a video. Lots of people are doing a video on, have done videos on how the prices of those hype pieces, the investment pieces, have rolled off. I won't say crashed, but they've certainly rolled off the boil. In the last week or so, one of the big secondary sellers, Chronext, has announced that they'll be sacking approximately a third of their staff in response to the losses that they're taking, or at least the reductions in revenue that they're experiencing as a result of this. I've got to say, I'm personally unsurprised that Chronex is in this position. I've wanted to buy watches from them for probably three years, but I found they're a very narrow catalog. They're very focused on those investment pieces. And once you get away from Rolex Patek, um, uh, AP, one or two hot Vacherons, their inventory becomes very, very thin. So as I said, I'm unsurprised that as the investment money has dried up, their revenue has gone with it. It'll be interesting to see what happens over at Watchbox uh, with the Govbergs. Uh, Brian Govberg has repeatedly said on podcasts and in interviews that well over half their income comes from just three brands, Rolex, Patek, and AP. In this current environment, I'd be really, it'd be fascinating to see what's happening with their income. But again, they're, I believe they're a private company, so we'll probably never know. 
WatchPro is reporting, though, that this uh, slowdown does appear to be isolated to the secondary market, that this is n- it doesn't seem to be affecting retail sales, which is not surprising when you look at the results that we're getting from uh, the, the export numbers out of the Federation Orology and the export and, and profit numbers that we're getting out of the big watchmakers. All of this tends to confirm a theory, certainly I, and I know a lot of other people have been putting forward, that the watch industry, the watch market at the moment, consists of broadly two distinctly different kinds of money. There's watch money, where people that want to buy a watch and appreciate a watch um, are doing that thing, they're buying watches, and then investment money where people that, frankly, don't give a shit about watches but just see it as an alternative investment asset um, are buying Rolexes and Pateks and APs and the occasional Vacheron. What you're seeing in this behaviour is how the watch money is continuing to do what it does. Slight increase over time. There may be a slight decrease as the, the wider economy tightens but nothing too drastic. It's kind of chugging along doing its thing. What you've seen is that the flow of investment money into watches has, I won't say dried up, but certainly slowed considerably. One important thing is it doesn't seem to be, doesn't seem to be running out. We're not seeing any fire sales of inventory. Chronext have shown that this is the, the, Certainly the industry players will fire their staff rather than realise losses and sell inventory potentially at a loss. I think that's what we're going to continue to see. People that are holding a lot of that sort of hype in uh, inventory that they perhaps overspent on in retrospect will simply hold it. They will fire staff, they will shrink down, they will move into industrial um, premises and save rent money. They'll do all of that cunning costs to the absolute bone before they actually once and for all have to realise a loss. Probably just hoping that the industry and just natural growth gets them to the point where they're not, they're not having to write down uh, permanent losses. So all in all, why my general take is that, yeah, the, the world is in a difficult place at the moment. It's not Armageddon. We're not approaching the end times or anything, but it is difficult. But having said that, I think the watch industry, the primary side of it, is going to do okay. The disciplines that they've learnt over the last couple of years, the steps that they took to manage COVID, is probably going to stand them in good stead moving forward. Will we see some oversupply? Quite possibly. There could be some small discounts, kind of the norm of what we expected a couple of years ago. I don't think we'll see massive plummeting sales. I don't think we'll see wholesale blood on the floor contracts being cut and and suppliers being dismissed as a result of this. On the secondary side, I think we'll see a slowdown. We'll probably see basically a bit of a buyer and seller strike. Buyers don't want to pay the prices. Sellers don't want to sell at the prices that buyers want. And so everything will just slow down and... Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But yeah, you might get a lot more YouTube videos from dealers because they haven't got a lot of other business going on. What do you think? Do you think I'm being overly optimistic? Do you think I'm being overly pessimistic? What do you think is going to happen on the market? Anyway, I've been Pete McConville. This has been Not So Obvious Watches. This is my take on the state of the watch industry mid-2022. See you later. Bye.